my great pleasure to introduce three of the brightest minds and advisors on U.S. foreign policy we have in this country tonight. Uh, Michelle Flournoy is co-founder and managing director of West Exec Advisors, which she started this year. Previously, she was CEO and co-founder of the Center for a New America Security, which a number of you will be visiting for the second year in a row this Friday. And prior to that, from uh, 2012, I'm sorry, from 2009 to 2012, she was Under Secretary of Defense. By the way, if I were to read all of the credentials of these three individuals, we would be going home at about midnight. Um, Evo Dalder, I had the pleasure of meeting with his wife Alyssa in Hilton Head in January. He is the, scene, he is the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and was U.S. Ambassador to NATO from 2009 to 2013. He spent many, many years at Brookings, and he is the co-author with James Lindsay of The Empty Throne, America's Abdication of Global Leadership. Jim is Senior Vice President, Director of Studies, and Maurice R. Greenberg, Chair uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he oversees more than six dozen fellows in the David Rockefeller Studies Program. He has also taught and was an inaugural director at the Robert Strauss Center for International Security Law at the University of Texas at Austin. So these two gentlemen wrote an amazing book. We're going to hear about that. And Michelle, over to you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. bipartisan left and right limits of American foreign policy, not only in style, but also in substance. Tell us more about what you, why you, why that diagnosis. Happy to do that. First, let me join uh, with what Michelle said and thank you all for being here. I've also had the opportunity to talk at World Affairs Council and I admire, someone's gonna turn up the mic. Uh, I hope they have just done that. Uh, you ask an important question, and I, I think it's important to understand that President Trump uh, has come to office with a different vision of how the United States should be engaged in the world. Uh, there's a lot of talk on the campaign trail that the president was an isolationist and was proposing an isolationist foreign policy. I don't think that got the president quite right. Uh, I think the president campaigned by arguing that the practice of American foreign policy over the last number of decades was fundamentally misaddressed. That Hello again, everyone. I ask you to, hello. It certainly sounds like you had some enjoyable conversation, and I hope you had a, no a lovely dinner as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayflower. It's great to be back at the Mayflower Hotel, actually. First time since 2012. Charlotte likes it, I know that. <laughs> 
we're going to be here for the next two years. Not from here to then, but <laughs> next November. <laughs> okay, the heart of the program. It's my great pleasure to introduce three of the brightest minds and advisors on U.S. foreign policy we have in this country tonight. Uh, Michelle Flournoy is co-founder and managing director of West Exec Advisors, which she started this year. Previously, she was CEO and co-founder of the Center for a New America Security, which a number of you will be visiting for the second year in a row this Friday. And prior to that, from uh, 2012, I'm sorry, from 2009 to 2012, she was Under Secretary of Defense. By the way, if I were to read all of the credentials of these three individuals, we would be going home at about midnight. Um, Evo Dalder, I had the pleasure of meeting with his wife Alyssa in Hilton Head in January. He is the scene, he is the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and was U.S. Ambassador to NATO from 2009 to 2013. He spent many, many years at Brookings and he is the co-author with James Lindsay of The Empty Throne, America's Abdication of Global Leadership. Jim is Senior Vice President, Director of Studies, and Maurice R. Greenberg, Chair uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he oversees more than six dozen fellows in the David Rockefeller Studies Program. He has also taught and was an inaugural director at the Robert Strauss Center for International Security Law at the University of Texas at Austin. So these two gentlemen wrote an amazing book. We're going to hear about that. And Michelle, over to you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. So um, Jim and Evo have written uh, what I would call a must-read book. Um, the Empty Throne is really telling the story of the first two years of this administration and the tremendous impacts that it may have for America's foreign policy and also our standing in the world. And so I want to spend the first 20 minutes having a conversation with them, letting them kind of lay out their argument. And then we'll open it up the second 20 minutes for questions from all of you. So be thinking about what you'd like to ask. So let's start with the sort of fundamental premise of the book. And, and Jim, I'm going to ask you first. You portray, I <laughs> you portray Trump as a fundamental departure from the norm. Not, not, you know, not in the way that Bush was different from Obama or Reagan was different than Clinton, but fundamentally a departure from the sort of bipartisan left and right limits of American foreign policy, not only in style, but also in substance. Tell us more about what you, why you, why that diagnosis. Happy to do that. First, let me join uh, with what Michelle said, and thank you all for being here, and also by the opportunity to talk at World Affairs Council, and I admire, someone's gonna turn up the mic. Uh, I hope they have just done that. Uh, you ask an important question, and I, I think it's important to understand that President Trump uh, has come to office with a different vision of how the United States should be engaged in the world. Uh, there was a lot of talk on the campaign trail that the president was an isolationist and was proposing an isolationist foreign policy. I don't think that got the president quite right. Uh, I think the president campaigned by arguing that the practice of American foreign policy over the last number of decades was fundamentally misaddressed. That American presidents had uh, prided themselves on leading other countries, our friends and allies, in tackling common problems to find solutions. And President Trump's argument, an argument he had made long before he threw his hat into the ring as president, was to argue that the key for the United States was not to try to lead, but to win and that America's friends and allies had tried to take advantage of the United States, and that the United States should recognize that world politics is a, uh, we might call sort of a dog-eat-dog, -dog, uh, win-or-lose kind of world, and that he was gonna focus on 
winning or beating our friends and allies uh, rather than leading, him, leading them. And that led the president uh, to question the value of multilateral alliances, uh, to question the value of multilateral trade agreements, and to argue that uh, America's concern with democracy, human rights, and uh, rule of law was fundamentally mistaken. So in that sense, the president uh, had a very different view of the world than uh, the founding uh, generation after World War II had taken, which had predicated the notion and been based on the notion that if America wanted to avoid repeating the two great catastrophes of the, tw of the 20th century, World War I and World War II, the United States not only had to be involved in the world, it had to leave the world. You describe in some detail um, how this Trump's foreign policy is contributing to almost an acceleration of the decline of the rules-based international order, which was already under pressure from a number of, of quarters. Um, tell us, help us understand what, why that matters so much. What are the consequences, whether it's in the security realm for our alliances, whether it's in the trade realm, whether it's in soft power areas, but our values, uh, human, you know, support for human rights and democracy. What are the consequences, in no kidding terms, to the United States of contributing to that devolution? Uh, so let, let me join Michelle and, and, and Jim in, in thanking uh, Phil and everyone else for, for inviting us here and, and to uh, warmly embrace your mission of which the Chicago Council on World Affairs uh, certainly shares the idea of bringing the world to all of the United States uh, in, in, the, uh, in the way that you all do in a terrific way. So uh, thanks uh, so much for, for, for being here and being interested. We were founded in 1922, like you were uh, at the same time, like the Council was, at a time immediately after World War I when the United States had made one of its most consequential decisions, which was to enter a global international conflict for the first time. We had stood aside and away from international engagement for uh, the better part of, for, for more than a century uh, of our existence, and in 1917 decided that we could no longer stand aside. We then made the decision in 1918 to step aside again, a fateful decision. By, by the way, when the president meets with 59 other leaders uh, in Paris uh, this Sunday, they will be remembering the Great War, but I hope they will also spend some time about the great mistake. The great mistake was for the United States not to continue its engagement in the world, and frankly, not to continue the leadership that Woodrow Wilson had shown as we were putting together uh, a, what was at that point hoped to be a new peace. We had a do-over. It cost 16 million lives to get there, but after World War II, when we made the decision, great, the greatest generation, Franklin Roosevelt, Truman, we all know them, they were all our friends. Uh, at least in our age, they're our friends. Um, uh, that's what we tell my students. Uh, uh, they, they made the decision that, in fact, the United States needed to learn the lesson of the 20s and the 30s, which was not only to engage in the world, but frankly have, because it was the only country that had the power, to lead to lead in creating this rules-based international system. A system of collective security based both in the United Nations and when the United Nations didn't work out in the way we had hoped, in part because of the beginning of the Cold War through a series of security alliances, through an economic international rules-based order based on the IMF and the Bretton Woods system, as well as a global international trading system, the belief that open markets uh, and having rules that guide open markets is important because it was the opposite of that that had led to such devastation in, in the interwar period. And the belief that democracy and freedom were important elements for uh, not only legitimizing America's actions abroad, but actually the belief that having more people living in democracy was more likely to contribute to stability, peace, and prosperity. And for 70 years, we led this system. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it was a fundamental tenet that we not only engage, but we lead. The system was under stress, and it's been under stress really since about two, the early 2000s. And it's been under stress for a whole bunch of reasons. One, most importantly, 
uh, the rise of other powers. After the Soviet Union collapsed, we were in this unique unipolar moment, as Charles Brownhammer put it. But there were other countries that were going to want to have a piece of the cake. China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Russia, which never really gave up its, its willingness to, uh, and, and desire to be part of it. So they were going to challenge that rules-based order that was a US-led order and, and, and be part of it. And we needed to figure out how to accommodate, how, to, how do you bring them into the system, or how to beat them uh, and, and still be able to, uh, to uh, uh, work uh, as best as possible. So that was one challenge. The second challenge really came after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, a belief that this globalization trend that we had pushed as, as strongly and, and as forcefully in the 2000s as we could uh, had, had divided people and left certain people behind, particularly in Western societies, that led to a growth of populism, a growth of nationalism, which was also challenging the rules-based order. So when Donald Trump was running for president, he wasn't creating the, the fissures in the rules-based order. He was exploiting them. And he was, uh, he was, in some ways, he was a symptom of it. But more importantly, he used it as a way to really challenge it. And that's what he's done in the last two years. In your book, you argue that as the US is pulling back from many of the traditional global leadership responsibilities, um, that, that the, the country that stands the biggest has the biggest opportunity to benefit is China, um, a rising China. And I wonder if we could spend, you know, we have a, um, at least a stated strategy from the administration, a defense strategy that talks about a new era of strategic competition with China uh, being the, the area of greatest concern. But the competition is clearly across uh, areas of the economy, technology, potentially in the security, domain and even in terms of uh, different political systems. So um, talk a little bit about how you see this um, uh, develop, set of developments in the US context affecting China's rise and, affect, and then how that in turn will affect our interests if China really does step into the vacuum. Well, the president has certainly created a vacuum on the global level. Uh, by walking away from a number of commitments. Again, uh, three days into the administration, the president left the Trans-Pacific Partnership, otherwise known as TPP. This is the uh, trade deal that involved 12 Pacific Rim countries, accounting for about 40% uh, of global output. Uh, it was designed both as a trade agreement to get Americans, American firms more access uh, to other markets, something like 18,000 tariffs on US goods uh, would have been rolled back, but it was also designed as a strategic counterweight to China. Basic intuition is if you bring uh, the most important economies in the most vibrant part of the world together and they set up a system of rules, the Chinese would sort of have to bend their will toward them. The president walked away from that, number one, without any kind of strategic review uh, as to what would come after it and without extracting any concessions from the Chinese. So it's not surprising that the Chinese reaction to TPP withdrawal by the United States was uh, outright glee, that the United States had created an opening and they tend to, intend to take it. Indeed, President Xi, just days before the, President Trump was inaugurated, went to Davos, where he presented himself to the world as the great defender of the rules-based order, uh, a great irony given that the Chinese had basically tried to exploit the rules to their own advantage for a long time. Now there's a, a big question as to whether or not the Chinese will be able to fill that vacuum. The fact that China has grown rapidly you know, over the last three decades doesn't mean it will continue to grow rapidly in the future. The Chinese have a lot of problems of their own. They're going to be the first country to grow old before they get rich. You have a political system that fundamentally rests on one pillar of legitimacy, that is producing economic growth. If that goes away, it's unclear how the Communist uh, Party of China will succeed. So as you look at that, one possibility isn't that China fills the vacuum, but that no countries fill the vacuum. 
And then you have to ask yourself, if you live in a world in which you go back essentially to great power competition with lots of powers sort of defending their spheres of influence, what kind of world is that going to be? And we have some sense of what it is. We've seen this movie before, so to speak. That was the world that the so-called greatest generation, the wise men, FDR, Harry Truman, Dean Atchison, George C. Marshall tried to avoid in creating this rules-based order before. That in essence, if you leave countries to their own devices to be basically normal, to pursue their narrow self-interest, conflict is likely to arise. You can talk in the abstract about spheres of influence, but the reality is, is that countries don't agree on where their spheres of influence end, and if some other countries, sphere of influence begins. And that, that was likely to lead to much greater conflict. And again, again that was what the world that the wise men of the greatest generation were trying to avoid. Let, let, let me add, if I can, on, on, on the China issue and the administration's approach to it. I mean, I think clearly the administration has recognized in a way that its predecessors didn't, that China is not just a country that is a great market for our goods, and if we open it up economically, it will open up politically, which was the big bet that Bill Clinton made in bringing China into the WTO. And frankly, uh, George Bush continued, and, and our engagement in, in, Ch in China for the last uh, 40 years was designed to bring them into our, uh, in, into our sphere, into our responsible stakeholder. I think the Trump administration has recognized that that's not working. That in fact, this is a strategic competitor, economically, politically, and militarily. Maybe partly because of some mistakes we have made, but it is. And so the question in, in, in how you deal with that strategic competition, which I think is the dominant question for American foreign and, and national security policy going forward, is how do you do that? How do you compete with the China that is as strong economically, politically, and militarily? And, uh, and I think uh, Vice President Pence, about a month ago, gave a big speech about how this was the defining element uh, in American foreign policy. The big difference between how this administration is dealing with this threat, which is the threat challenge that it recognizes, and previous ones is we would have, in previous administrations, brought along our allies. We would have thought that we have one advantage over China which is we have allies and friends and they don't, they have clients. And so you bring together the Europeans and the Japanese uh, and the Australians and the Indians in a large allied uh, effort to, to try to mold Chinese behavior back into a rules-based system. We don't spend a lot of time talking about allies, we can talk more about that, but we have actually alienated our friends and allies by conducting this sort of we need to beat everybody at every price kind of foreign policy that we've seen in the last two years. That's the biggest, it seems to me, departure from where we have been over the past 70 years. Not recognizing the one, the one thing we have, uh, allies, friends, partners, uh, the six largest, uh, of, the, of the 10 largest economies, seven are allied to the United States. Of the 10 largest militaries, six are allied to the United States. That's our advantage in the competition we have with China, and we are well on the way to losing that competition. And there's also a great irony here, which is, as everyone knows, President Trump campaigned in 2015 and 2016 by criticizing America's friends and allies for not doing enough and that they needed to do more. Uh, that was the argument of candidate Trump, but President Trump hasn't in fact turned around and asked the, uh, our friends and allies to do more. Indeed, on a lot of issues, it's clearly on trade and dealing with the Chinese, the administration essentially has rebuffed efforts uh, by America's friends and allies to do more, essentially saying we can take care of it ourselves. And it's not just on trade. Uh, we see this on uh, the Iran nuclear deal, where the Germans, the French, and the British took very seriously the concerns the uh, Trump administration had leveled against Iranian behavior and the shortcomings of the uh, uh, nuclear deal. Uh, but at the end of the day, when the, when the British, the French, and the Germans came forth with their proposal, the administration didn't even subject it to any sort of serious uh, review or negotiation. 
And again, those are messages that our friends and allies take, that if the United States wants to go off on its own and, and act on its own, that's what it's going to do. But in that sense, the United States does exactly the opposite of what Canada Trump has said, and it's taking more burdens upon its shoulders, not fewer. Yeah. You know, I remember uh, after the end of the first year of the administration being asked by someone whether I could carry, you know, sort of, is there a pattern here? Is there, is there a Trump doctrine? And, and one of the, my answers at the time was, the word I would use to describe what I see is deconstruction. It was really you know, the withdrawal from the Paris Climate uh, Accord, the withdrawal from the Iran nuclear agreement, um, the withdrawal from TPP, the withdrawal from NAFTA, even though that was subsequently renegotiated. And now, most recently, the withdrawal from the, or the, the intention to withdraw from the Intermediate uh, Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, you all talk about, um, you all argue that this, there's, there's consequence associated with this for the United States and some damage that is being done, certainly to US credibility, but also beyond that. The question I have is um, how much of that is reversible versus irreversible? So you know, if Trump were to uh, lose the election in 2020, you have a new president who, you know, more likely a Democrat, but say there was a Republican challenger. It could be Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter, but they were more in the traditional set, you know, bipartisan norm, if you will. How much of the damage that you think is being done to our interests, to our credibility, is reversible? And, and, and what kinds are maybe not recoverable? So in many ways, this was the toughest question we had to ask ourselves. And, and it, it wasn't, we never really came to a very highly definitive solution that says it's totally irreversible, it's never, it, 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 it's, it's all over, or, uh, oh no, this is, this is a time period we can easily uh, get away with. I think the argument we make in the book is the longer you continue down this path, the more difficult it will be to reverse it. And mainly because American leadership is based on trust. All leadership in some fundamental form is based on trust, not just power. You need power in order to, to get things done, but you need people to trust you to do it in the right way. Good leadership is trustful leadership. And that trust is being broken in a very, very fundamental way. I mean, we had the president of France yesterday announced that we need a European army. Something the French have, by the way, supported for a very long time. But now, for the first time, we need a European army because we have a threat from Russia, we have a threat from China, and we have a threat from the United States of America. That is a quite remarkable statement for any European president or prime minister uh, to, and even for a French uh, prime minister uh, <laughs> uh, to put forward. And this is, not, this is not the 1960s. Uh, and, and even Charles de Gaulle would not have put it in those terms. Um, and that is, a, that is a remarkable statement. What underlies that is a sense that the fundamental nature of the relationship, which is based on trust, is broken. And as we know, in any relationship when trust is broken, rebuilding it is much more difficult uh, than breaking it in the first place. So, uh, if the president were to decide tomorrow that he wants to try to rebuild trust, or if it is the next administration, Democrat or Republican, uh, who is going to try to build this, it's going to be really tough. Because in the meantime, countries have made decisions. They have moved on. And you see this most of them, clearly in the trade sense. The Canadians have created a Department of Trade Diversification. They've decided that relying on trade down south doesn't make as much sense anymore. They need to diversify their trade routes. They believe that the EU and the Canadian EU trade agreement is now more important. And maybe a Canadian Chinese agreement than the Canadian uh, Japanese agreement. Uh, that uh, Canada's already, of course, part of the TPP. And expanding that and making that your rules based new. Uh, kind of order, and diversifying away from the United States, by the way, at great cost to, you, to U.S. producers of products, of agriculture, and everything else who are paying the price uh, of the reality that the EU 
TPP countries are all moving on to building these new relationships, and they're not going to be undone. And producers are going to start having new kinds of uh, supply chains, and they're not going to be undone uh, because the reality is this takes time to build. That's the damage. The damage is that countries are staking, are taking steps that are basically saying, so you don't want to play with us, well, maybe we don't need you. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then I want to point out that there are microphones here and here. If you want to ask a question, please line up at the microphone. And when I turn to you, I'll ask you to introduce yourself and then actually ask a question. Um, so in your book, one of the biggest recommendations you make is for what you call a G9, a group of nine uh, like-minded countries, I think all of them allies or close partners of the United States, who can step up and step in to more of a global leadership role for the period where the US may be more absent, almost like a holding action. Jim, can you un unpack that notion? What are you really talking about here, and how would it work? I'd be happy to do so, and it builds off of the point that Evo just made. As you look out at the future of the rules-based order, which I would point out has brought great prosperity and security to the United States. It didn't just benefit America's friends and allies, it benefited the United States. And its costs, at least as the president tells it, are greatly exaggerated. Uh, whether we're talking about defense spending as a share of GDP, uh, or you're talking about the impact that trade has on jobs here in the United States. This rules-based order is worth preserving. America's interests are tied up, and American values are tied up in preserving that order. But again, this is not an order that the president believes in or is trying to save. And so this order is on the clock, but it's the outcome of sort of that erosion, whether it picks up speed and we get the, a point of irreversibility, won't be determined just by decisions made in Washington, D.C. And I, we don't argue, and I want to come away with the impression that Donald Trump is responsible for everything. And, and we would argue, and again, the president uh, has some legitimate concerns. Uh, and one of them is that our friends and allies, countries that have benefited from this order and have a great stake in uh, continuing, should do more to keep that order around. So what we had argued for, and this is an extended piece in uh, this current issue of foreign affairs, is that these countries, the G9, members of the European Union, Britain, Germany, France, Australia, Canada, South Korea, I won't do the whole list, uh, need to consciously think about what is it that they can do to address the administration's concerns and to do more uh, to sustain the rules-based order, whether we're talking about on the security front, whether we're talking on the trade front, or whether we're talking on the human rights front. Obviously, on the, human, uh, on the security front, uh, our friends and allies, particularly those in NATO's, can and should spend more. You're intimately familiar with that uh, issue, Michelle. Evo obviously was familiar with the issue, uh, having been a U.S. ambassador to NATO. But in 2014, our friends in uh, NATO agreed that they would uh, agree to spend 2% of their GDP on defense by, uh, was it 2024? Uh, which required actually quite a substantial uh, increase in overall military capability. So they should live up to those pledges. Uh, likewise, on the trade front, there's more that America's trading partners can do to strengthen the WTO, uh, to address predatory trade practices by the Chinese, but by countries besides China, and also to fight for human rights, democracy, promotion, and the rule of law. And because this is an administration, the president, essentially has said he's not interested uh, in standing up for democracy or human rights. I can give you lots of examples. Perhaps the one that was most visible was his initial reaction to the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, last month. And in that sense, the United States is a, na is a normal country that shouldn't bear any particular burdens. And the president on the flip side has been very uh, kind to our authoritarian governments. And that's actually accelerating what is some people refer to as a democratic recession or a democratic regression. Whether you're talking in Asia or you're talking in Europe or in Latin America, we see a number of countries that are in to some degree de-democratizing. So the real challenge you run into if you get a new president in 2020 or 2024 is that our circle of friends will be much smaller because the countries that used to be like-minded with us and shared our values simply have gone by the way.
one final point on that is that we tend to think of countries' allegiances as permanent. But all the countries we're talking about, they all have domestic politics. They all have public opinion. And the United States, for decades, benefited from two things. One, it defeated the Nazis, and it stared down the Soviet Union. That built up enormous political capital, trust, as Evo pointed out. Trust that was able to withstand honest disagreements over a variety of policy issues. It's never the case that the rules-based order was one of perfect harmony between the United States uh, and its friends and partners. But now we're increasingly seeing that the percentage of people who uh, were born in the shadow of World War II or the Cold War is growing smaller. And the percentage of people whose knowledge of the United States is of a country that invaded Iraq, that triggered a great recession around the world through a subprime mortgage crisis, that waterboarded prisoners, that is hostile to immigrants uh, and refugees, that refuses to believe that climate change is an existential threat, you run the very real possibility that you lose younger generations. And that feeds back into politics, making it harder for governments, even when they want to work with us, to work with us. Yeah. On that happy note, let's open it up for, um, I'm Mr. for Q&A. So we have I'm usually the pessimist in this program. So, Sir, please tell us who you are and ask your question. Thank you. No, it's not on. So it's not just us. It's not on. Well, I would, I would note a couple of things. The reason that President Trump was elected president had to do with a lot more than just with trade. We need to recognize that there were lots of other factors and you can gather political scientists and argue back and forth about which was most important. But I take your point that for many people who voted for President Trump feel that they have been left behind by globalization. Uh, I will note two things. One is that the impact of trade on employment in the United States, or as a cause of job loss, tends to be greatly exaggerated. Indeed, if you talk to economists who spend their time studying this, the single most important factor in, particularly the decline of manufacturing jobs, has been technology. The fact is, we can produce much more today than with the same amount of human capital as we could in the past. And all you have to do is sort of look at a picture of the factory floor at Ford Motor Company, probably in the 1970s, and compare what it looks like today. If you look at the picture back in the 1970s, you see a factory floor with lots of people. You look at it today, you see a factory floor with lots of machines, robots we call them, uh, putting cars together. And indeed, if you were to chart the decline of manufacturing jobs as a share of overall jobs in the US economy, it has been on a downward decline for the last 70 years. And 
So it's not because China entered the WTO that all of a sudden US manufacturing uh, was in jeopardy. And indeed, this is my great concern about the administration's approach to the jobs issue is that it's focused on trade, which has had some impact, uh, but a much smaller impact. But it is focused in trade and ignoring how technology is changing employment markets. And we all talk about artificial intelligence. And the reality is, is that revolution is picking up speed. And there's a battle, number one, among countries as to who's going to win that race. Vladimir Putin says whoever wins it will own the world. Uh, but beyond that, a lot of jobs in this country depend upon or are going to be affected by digitization. We talk a lot about having driverless cars, and there may be great uh, advantage to that unless you make a living as a truck driver. Okay? And we're not really thinking through uh, how to adapt to the challenges coming down the road because we're still looking backward. Second point I would make about this issue is that What's remarkable is that if you look at public opinion polls, and Evo's organization, the Chicago Council for Global Affairs, does the gold standard polling about how Americans feel about public opinion, is that Donald Trump has actually been good for internationalism. Why is that? Because people who previously or currently work in, in industries that depend on trade always credited themselves for their hard work for their success. Now all of a sudden they realize that it wasn't just their success, their hard work that let them succeed. It was the fact that they were able to sell into other markets. Now all of a sudden as the ability to sell into those other markets goes away, uh, either because we're slapping tariffs on our friends as well as our foes, uh, or because we are uh, walking away from trade agreements, all of a sudden people are realizing how much they have at stake. And again, to your question, if you want people to care more about the order, you've got to do a better job of talking about how they stand to benefit, which again is the work that all the people around this room do to help Americans have a better, deeper, richer, fuller understanding of how the world works and why what happens beyond America's borders matters to Americans is incredibly important work. So next question. Um, my question was on, you spoke about trust and the decline of trust within the Trump presidency, and I was wondering where you thought the start of that regression of trust was. Was it with Trump? And how are we going to get that back? So how are we going to increase the trust in the government and thus creating a more sort of successful government in general? So I was talking about trust in of other countries in the United States, and that is also a longer period. It predates Trump uh, in, in many ways, and has been accelerated under, uh, under the current president. The trust in government is something that has been going south uh, among Americans for a much longer period of time. I'd say at least since the early 1970s. Uh, and if you, I, I don't know the opinion polls exactly, but I think the American belief in government from, and, and trusting government to be, to, to, uh, to do the right thing uh, from the Vietnam and Watergate period onwards has been in a perpetual decline. And we have had uh, successive presidents, starting with Ronald Reagan, uh, arguing that government is the problem, it's not the solution. Same thing that Bill Clinton said in 1996, by the way, uh, 1997 uh, State of the Union address. Uh, so it became a bipartisan uh, uh, view uh, that government was part of the problem. And we've, we've continued that to the point that uh, I think uh, the, uh, the only part of the US government that still has majority confidence and support is the US military. Um, and I'll just put a footnote here which is why it is so dangerous to politicize the military as uh, uh, may have occurred or in some ways is occurring on the border with Mexico. Uh, because it is taking the one institution that still has the trust of the American people and trying to play it from a political angle in a different, in a different way. I think this is a huge problem for our country. Uh, and uh, we are running elections 
uh, now on the deep division on whether government has a role to play, positive or negative, whether the, pre whether the press has a positive or negative uh, role to play, whether our judiciary is independent or not. Uh, these are very dangerous, in my view, uh, uh, questions that are being posed to fundamental institutions of stability uh, uh, that we have taken for granted for a very long time and no longer can take for granted. And we, will, we need to find new ways uh, to rebuild the confidence and trust in these institutions. Because if we don't, uh, we're going to continue to descend into the deep divisions that we are living in, which we saw last night. Uh, if you didn't like, if you if if you didn't like red and blue, you're not going to be living in this country because it's red and blue. There ain't anything in between anymore. Uh, increasingly, I, I I come from from Illinois. It's the bluest of bluest states now. Um, uh, and as a result, uh, tribalism is taking over uh, from government and from governance, uh, and that is a deeply problematical challenge to our system that, again, all of us as institutions who care about what's happening in the world and care what's happening in our country uh, need to find ways to, to rebuild that confidence and rebuild that trust. It's a hard task, but we all need to do it. I think we have time for one more short question. Yes. Uh, my name is George Payne. I've been to the World Affairs Forum in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, my foreign affairs arrived Monday, so I got to read your article last night as I was catching. And uh, the short version, the shortest version of the question is why would not a G9 supply the logic for a future American alliance system? And to elaborate what I mean, we have a system of alliances, NATO, US, Japan, US, uh, ANZUS, US, South Korea, the underlying logic of which has been containment of a virulent uh, and ideological threat, a logic of which has been gone for going on 30 years. If we were to, but your G9 article points out that there's a logic of countries that share this commitment to, frankly, and, and, and frankly share a living commitment to rule of law, liberties, individual liberty, democracy, and so forth. Obviously, many, many steps to get there, but hypothetically, would that not be a more appropriate uh, alliance structure, underlying alliance structure for this nation? Would that commitment not do something Small, uh, get inspired in this direction of trust. And what would it take to get Yeah, no, I think it's a very good question, and I think that is part of the logic of, uh, of what, so, uh, of, of why we wrote the article, uh, which actually comes from something that Jim and I wrote 12 years ago uh, on uh, an alliance of democracies. Uh, and a community of democracies, a concert of democracies, but the idea that democracy should actually come together uh, and, and uh, use the capacity of, of multilateral cooperation uh, to deal with the challenges that we face and not look at it purely in geographical terms, which is how we build up our uh, alliance systems for reasons that you, that you articulated with the Cold War and, and everything else. So, our argument with the G9 is say we need somebody to, to uh, uphold the rules-based order which is being undermined, of course, by China and Russia, but now, frankly, by the United States as well. Not because we think they can be a substitute for the United States. You still need a leader in order to make this work, but it, because if they work together for the next few years, you can maintain the order so that when the United States decide it needs to lead that order again, it can be part of it. Uh, and, 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 and the order will still be there. And by the way, it will now be based on the cooperation, not just among European allies, but among European and Asian allies. That's where the new, uh, the new piece comes in. If they do more on defense, which they need to, if they continue to maintain strong international trading relationships that set the gold standard of how to have trade relationship at a very high level, uh, if they maintain a commitment to democracy, the rule of law, and human rights for that period, when the United States decides, and I think it's a when, not an if, when the United States decides that it wants to be part of, of the effort to rebuild that and strengthen that rules-based order, it will have a natural set of allies who have now done more. Uh, exactly what Donald Trump and Barack Obama 
and every president since Harry Truman has asked for, which is the allies to do more economically and militarily. And you could then have a stronger, uh, not only rules-based order, but a, a rules-based order that was based on a strong US, strong European, and strong Asian allied bases of like-minded democratic countries. And that would be more likely to succeed in dealing with the growing challenge from a country like China than if we were trying to do it on our own. So yes, the hope is that if the G9 were to do what we think they should do, which is to step up as the US steps down, um, that you then have created the basis for a new set uh, of arrangements uh, in, uh, in, at, at, the, at the point at which the United States decide. And uh, as I said, it could be Donald Trump tomorrow. It could be a successor uh, whenever that successor uh, is elected. Um, decides that it's, ta it's time again for the United States to lead and to be part of the rules-based order and to do so with more capable uh, allies who are stretched around the globe uh, and increasingly may have countries from Africa and, 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 and Brazil and, and Latin America working with us. A quick addendum, if I may, just on that point. It's important that our allies do more, not just because they have a stake in that order, but because it is critical if you want to have an American president rally Americans uh, to believe in the value of the order, it will help if they can point legitimately to sh answer this question, long-standing one, but our friends and allies aren't doing enough, so why should we do anything? Uh, sort of a cut your nose off to spite your face worldview, and that's why I think it's important for our friends and allies not to give up on the United States, but to do more, but I don't think Americans should come away thinking that the patience of our friends is infinite. Well, I am sorry to say we have run out of uh, time in uh, this conversation, but I think I'll end where I started, which is you can clearly see this is a, ver uh, a provocative book with a lot of uh, a very um, interesting uh, argument that I hope will, you will continue to discuss uh, as you go back home uh, to your, the, your, the various councils, because I think this is the question of our time. Um, this is the challenge that we have to grapple with uh, as Americans who care about the world and, and how we influence the world and how the world impacts us. So please join me in thanking James and Can we thank you?